We're continuing our series of lessons on alleged Bible contradictions. I think it's very important for us to study such topics that are needed in today's world. And I'd like to start off with a story that, to make a point, there was a professor at a college who would do his regular routine every single day of asking three questions to his students. And he would ask them, have you ever felt God? Have you ever heard God? Have you ever seen God? And he just asked these every single day. And some of the students were getting tired of it. And one student in particular was getting really tired of it and decided to stand up and face against this professor. So she stood up one day after he had given his little routine and he said to the and she I mean she said to the students, Have you ever felt the professor's brain? Have you ever seen the professor's brain? Have you ever touched the professor's brain? And so she just go on and she says, Hey, if he says you can't feel God, you can't hear God, you can't see God, and if he doesn't exist, well, what about that professor's brain? He must not, his brain must not exist, is what they would say. And so we think about in such ways that this is going to come up, and I want to show you how this would uh, come about. When we see uh, the alleged discrepancy in John 1, verses 14 through 18, that the skeptics will point out, they'll say that, for example, that God is supposedly to be seen but yet cannot be seen. And they would say, they would cry out, contradiction. And so they would go to such verses like Exodus 33, where God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai, where God says, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock, so it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. In John 1, verse 18, as Brother Jerry read for us, no one has seen God at any time. And then 1 John 4, verse 12, as John writer says again, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. And then we think about Exodus 33, verse 11, which the skeptics will take and say, See, here's a contradiction. They'll say, See, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. I thought God's face could not be seen, is what they would say. And so we have to really reflect on these things and talk about what does God mean? What, is, what does the Bible mean about these passages? They even go to Jacob when he was wrestling with God. And for he says, For I have seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. And so how is it that God can be seen but yet not be seen? It is certainly the case that we must look at it from a different point of view. And that's what we want to do. We want to look at some principles that help us in our study. First, we have to look at the first principle that will help us in our study is that we must look at words in different ways, different senses. And so take the word code, for example. You know, we use the sense sometimes, she gave me the cold shoulder. Well, what was that referring to? That's referring to her attitude. There's also, might we say, it is cold outside. What is that referring to? Temperature. And so you can see how cold is used in different ways. Well, it's the same way with seeing God. It's used in different ways. Look at some of the scriptures that gives us an example of how words are used in different ways. Remember in James 2 where James was talking about that you should not show partiality to the poor man? And he talks about how they, that you can't, that sadly some people do show partiality to the rich by heeding to the rich man that comes to the congregation. Well, he says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Now, that's very important because as we see from those scriptures, there is a difference in those senses of those words. Because the word poor in this case is referring to their financial status. The word rich is referring to their spiritual well-being. And that is the case that we can be rich in Christ, but yet we can also be poor financially. And so that's something we need to think about. We also can think about as Paul, when he was dealing with false teachers, and he was trying to show that he was a true, um, true messenger of God, that he tried to stick to it, and that he would stick to the gospel, that he says in Philippians 3, 12-15, Not that I've already obtained, or am already made perfect, but I press on, if so be that I may lay hold on that for which also I lay hold on by Christ Jesus. Brethren, 
I could not count myself yet to have laid hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and looking forward to the things which are before. I press on toward the goal and to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, be thus minded. If anything, you are otherwise minded. Now that's very important because Paul uses perfect in two different senses in that. And in fact, skeptics have tried to charge this as being a contradiction of God's word. When in fact we see there's two different ways of looking at this. The word perfect in verse 15 in the blue that refers to spiritual maturity in Christ, that we are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, as Jesus stated. We can try to grow in being in a relationship with Christ, but we have not yet attained the high calling of the prize as in Christ Jesus. We have not yet achieved that perfect state status, and that's something that we are to look forward to. And so that's what we can see how the word perfect is used in two different senses. As Brother um, Jerry read for us, John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is John speaking of? He's speaking of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then I want us to think about John 1 verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then John goes on to say in John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. Now let me ask you a few questions. Is it true that Jesus was God? Was Jesus God? Of course he was. John 1.1 1, 1 points that out. Is it the case that men saw Jesus? Yes. John 1.14. John talks about how he saw Christ. So is it the case that man saw Jesus who is God? Yes. So, what does John mean, though? No one has seen God at any time. That is what we're trying to figure out. In what sense has man never seen God? And the, and the answer to that is that no one has ever seen Jesus in his true image, in his spiritual form that is full of grace, splendor, glory. No one has seen God like that, ever. And so that's what it means when no one has seen God at any time. When we think about Jesus, how he came in the flesh 2,000 years ago, he came in a veiled form. He came in the, he, in the embodiment of human flesh. That's therefore why people couldn't see him as the true image of God because he, he, was, hidden, uh, he was hidden by that. He was veiled by that. And so that's why we read in Philippians 2, verse 6 and 7, Jesus, who existing in the form of God, Counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptying himself and taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. That's something very important, that Jesus became the God-man. And so that's something we need to recognize. So whenever anybody saw God in the Bible, in biblical times, they saw a manifestation of God. They saw a, what's called a theophany. They saw him in a vision, in a dream. and But they never did see his true form. And that's something that we need to take, that we need to take a case. Take, for instance, Judges 13, 15 through 17. Remember, the angel of the Lord, which would better probably be translated the messenger of the Lord, because I believe the messenger of the Lord is referring to God himself. And so here he comes to Manoah and Mrs. Manoah and to talk to them about the birth of Samson. And so he says to the, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please, let us detain you and we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? That when, you, when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Doesn't that remind you of Isaiah chapter 9? That Jesus is called wonderful. I believe this is called, talking about the pre-incarnated Jesus. Before he took on flesh. Because as you read on, it says, Manoah took the young goat with a grain offering and offered it up on the rocks of the Lord. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended into the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord appeared to more, uh, no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Manoah said to his wife, 
we will surely die because we have seen God. Now, did they see God in his true spiritual form? No, they saw God as a manifestation, as a messenger, a spiritual messenger. But they didn't see his, the full manifestation of God in all his spiritual splendor and glory. Genesis 32, remember how Jacob, he was wrestling with a man. Right? To give you some indication that it, God appeared to him as a manifestation of a man. And so here they are, they're, they're, try, they're wrestling, and then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. And now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And I said, Jacob. And so now the angel of the Lord. Uh, so we see there that an example of Jacob seeing God, but he saw him in a different manifestation. Same thing with Hagar. As she is being left behind, as she is being pushed away by Sarah, the angel of the Lord meets up with her. And she says that she called on the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Because she saw the same manifestation that Manoah and Mrs. Manoah saw. The angel of the Lord. So, a second principle that we need to keep in mind is that we need to look at what does face-to-face phrase mean? We've looked at how to look at God and seeing God in different senses. Now let's look at this. What does this phrase mean? Remember the time when in Numbers chapter 12 how we have Miriam and Aaron, brother and sister of Moses. They were just arguing against Moses, saying, Hey, Moses, you know, you get all the credit. You take all the leadership from God. Well, God's, God's spoken to us, and they were just getting jealous of Moses. And here we see in this passage that God comes and he defends Moses. And so God says, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. Oh, there we go. He makes known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So we see there that God was always speaking through the children of Israel when he spoke through the prophets, spoke to them in the dream, spoke to them in the vision. But when he spoke to, with Moses, he spoke to him plainly. And the, what we need to see that as is that, in a sense, Moses saw God not, not in his true spiritual form, but just saw a great manifestation of his power and splendor and glory because God never did show his face to Moses. And that's something that we need to recognize. <clears throat> to make some applications to our lives, I think that as we have given an answer to these allegations, we need to recognize some great applications for us. And I think 3 John verse 11 gives us a great passage of Scripture where he says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Now that's very interesting. Those who are evil have not seen God. Those who are righteous, they have seen God. And I think it really comes into play when Jesus in his Beatitudes in Matthew 5 verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. What does it mean to be pure? Something that's where it's not mixed with error, not mixed with any sorts of forms of evil or hypocrisy. It is truly just, uh, uh, you know, separated from all of that. And that's something that we need to recognize, that we need to be pure in heart. And I think when we recognize the Beatitudes, it's really interesting when you read them. Because you often think of that, you know, they're always talking about maybe future tense. But really, God, Jesus is presenting them as present tense. Think about, think back to Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to think about that. Blessed are those who humble themselves, who realize they need God, and they will 
turn themselves over to God, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Think about another one. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who have strength under control, for they will inherit God's blessings on this earth. God will richly bless us. That's present. But we have to take God's gift. We have to receive it. We have to receive the blessings that he bestows upon us. And so when we come down here to Matthew 5 verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That is something that we can presently do. Now, we weren't, we're not going to see God in a dream or a vision or something like that. It's that we are in a righteous standing with God. And that's something that we need to, to think about is that I need a righteous life in order to see God. But before I have a righteous life, before I know that I need to do what is right, what, what do I need to do? I need to become a Christian and so in John 3, verses 1 through 8, it's very interesting because there was a man who came to Jesus by night. What was his name? His name was Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. And look what he was looking for the kingdom of God because he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So when Jesus answered and said to him, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice that. And then keep going. Nicodemus said to him, How can man be born when he is old? Can a, he enter a second time to his mother's womb and he be, be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do you see how Jesus is using those two phrases there? And he's kind of making them parallel. I think that's a very interesting case. Because unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, what does it take to, be, to see God's reign come into our lives? We must be born of water and spirit. We must be born of baptism. That's where the water it comes into place. Because that is where the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from our sins. And then we see the word spirit there, uh, I believe is referring to a spirit of contriteness, or it could also be referring to the Holy Spirit who re revealed his word to us and that we need to repent and change our lives. We need to do what's right. And that's something that takes place, that if one wants to see God, then that's what we must do. Now let's move on to alleged discrepancy number two. We talked about that you know no one has seen God at any time, but yet man has seen God, and that's something that I think we could also uh, always apply to our lives about what that's talking about. Now what we want to do is look at another verse. So look at James one twelve and thirteen where it says, "Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love Him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil." Neither tempeth he any man. And then look at Genesis 20, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now the question is, does God tempt man or does he not tempt man? What is, I mean, what, what can we say? What is the answer to this? And the answer is this, my brethren, in that when we look at these verses, this argument is based on the King James Version. That's where I was reading James 1, 12 and 13. And there is a different meaning for that word. And I want us to recognize that. And sadly, what skeptics do is they jump onto this only one meaning. And they say, see, that refers to tempt. And so, but when we look at the Hebrew word here in Genesis 22, verse 1, it's really interesting. There are Hebrew scholars who have said that the first meaning to this word should be the word to test to try and it's found in another another uh, lexicon to test so you can see there's another meaning for that and that is to test not to tempt when we go to first samuel verse 17 through uh verse 39 remember david was about to fight goliath and he's going to put on saul's armor and the same hebrew word is used here where it says david fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them and david said to saul i cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Now, did this testing have to do anything with the tempting of armor? No, it did not. No, no such case. Isn't that 
This word means to test. How about Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, where God says to Israel, You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. Is it the case that God tests us? Yes, God tests us. Because He wants us to be stronger in the faith. And so we need to recognize that He was doing the same thing with Israel. In Exodus 20, verse 20, this is very interesting, where Moses says to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that His fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So we see here that God shows a difference between testing and temptation, because temptation only comes from Satan. Satan's the one who wants to tempt us to do wrong. God is the one who wants to help us to endure. So what are some applications for our lives? Well, the case is this, where James says in, into the theme of sufferings, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance. But let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When we have the trials of life bearing down upon us, and we know that we need a higher power, we should look to God, pray to Him, help us to gain strength by reading His Word, knowing that He is working in our lives. We should recognize that we can see the same example when Abraham's faith was put to the test by giving his son Isaac and on the altar, and that his faith was working with endurance because he did not recognize the full outcome of what he was doing and then of course god said to him now i know and he's doing it for abraham's benefit that he that he did that and so we need to recognize that our faith has its perfect work and that it can work toward maturity alleged discrepancy number three you know often people will try to turn to such scriptures as these that i'm listing and they'll try to say how, did in the, how is it the case that if God is a spirit, that he has body parts? And they'll say, like, look at the, he has the arm of God, the hand of God, the face of God, the eyes of God, the ears of God, the mouth of God, the voice of God, the finger of God. They'll say, hey, how can he be a spirit but yet have these fleshly parts? And so, how do we deal with this? How can we recognize what the Bible teaches on this? And I think we need to recognize that God is does not necessarily he doesn't have these physical human characteristics because we I would agree that with the skeptic that God does not have these but he, God has these in a certain sense and that's something that we need to recognize and that is that the scriptures teach that God always tries to accommodate himself to our level and how we talked about last week talked about how God knows everything and he tries to bring that down to us and helping us for our benefit to know what he means and through his scriptures. And I think that's the same thing here. That it's difficult for us to conceive of a spiritual being. And so God has to, you know, bring forth language that we can understand. And so that's what he's trying to do. And so when we go to such verses like Moses and Aaron, when they unleash the power of God, the plagues of, uh, upon Egypt. through, And so it says, when the Pharaoh's magicians, they concluded, this is the finger of God. What Are they saying this is God's little finger? Little finger? No, that's not what they're saying. They're saying, look at God's manifestation of his power that he has unleashed upon us. That's what God is talking, that's what is being talked about. Or how about when God gave the original Ten Commandments? God wrote with wrote them with his own finger, it says. Well, what is that saying in Deuteronomy 9, verse 10? Well, it said God authored and supernaturally did it himself, and they did it by his power. Or Psalm 8, 3 and 4, where David is praising God for his creative power. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? It is the case that God does not have fleshly fingers. But we must recognize that God has the power to will anything out of nothing into existence. How about when Jesus stated when he was you know, doing demon, when there was demon possession in somebody, that he exercised that demon out of that person. 
And therefore, he did it, as he says in Luke 11, verse 20, I cast out demons with the finger of God. And what's so interesting in the parallel passage of the other gospel accounts is that Jesus did it by the Spirit of God. Once again, we see that deity is working his power among the people. And that's something we must recognize. And so some great applications for our lives that we can make from this is that we need to recognize that when God is using this language, he's trying to help us to understand him and try to help us to make our relationship what it should be. And so when I think about such questions, am I holding to the hand of God? Am I in a right right relationship with, with him? Or have I let sin, have I let an idol come into my heart? Because I need to listen to Isaiah 59, 1, 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. You see, that's why we can't see the face of God because of our sins. And in order to see God's face, in order to behold his glory, in order to know him, we must come and do what is right. And that's, are we, re- are we ready to do so? Do I cause God's face to shine away from me? As he said in Isaiah 59 verse 22. Am I doing something that is bringing shame to God? Or what does God see me doing in my life? Because as we recognized last week, God sees everything. He knows everything. And we must recognize that he should have Every single part of our lives and held in his hand. And so when 1 Peter 3 verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Do I listen to the words that proceed from the mouth of God? When Jesus was being tempted by the devil... One of the greatest passages of Scripture, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus came not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. Are we ready to develop and adopt the attitude that Jesus possessed, that he was willing to do everything the Father uh, said, and to please him? That's what we should be doing as children of God, to please our Heavenly Father. How about, am I attentive and listening to God's voice. How does God speak today? Does he speak to me in a dream? Does he speak to me in a vision? No. No, he doesn't speak to me at midnight when I'm fast asleep. He speaks to me through these words right here. These inspired words. And we need to think about what God is saying to us in Hebrews 3, verse 7 and 8. Where he said to the generation that fell in the wilderness, he said, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. As in the days of the rebellion, as in the day of trial and the wilderness, are we going to test God just like Israel did? We shouldn't be. We should want to be the new Israel that is like Jesus, who always followed in his followers' footsteps. Do I let the finger of God, do I let it work in my life? Now, I'm I'm not talking about miracles. I'm just talking about letting him work through the word of God. Am I letting God do that? Because if not, I need to make a change. I need to let God touch my life. And let and I need to start doing what's right. So in Romans 1 verse 16, where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, and to everyone that believes, and also to the Greek. Are we willing to know that the finger of God, where was God's finger? Finger, where was it really pointed at? Where was his greatest form of power manifested? Was it at creation? No, it was at redemption. When Jesus gave his son to die on the cross, that's where the finger of God was pointing at, and that he showed his love, he showed his justice at the cross because he was willing to give his son to love the world so much that he was willing to let his son die for all men. For our sins. For what we committed. And we need the love of God. We need His grace. Friends, we also know that if we do not receive His grace, we will receive His justice. And the receiving of justice is not something that I'm very happy about. It's something that we should not be happy about because that is sadly condemnation. 
That is something that we justly deserve because of our sin. We must recognize sin for what it really is. Are we willing to let our sins go because it is gone when we obey the gospel? Are you willing to obey the gospel this morning? Why not do so while together we stand and sing the invitation song? Oh, Lord.